Good afternoon, everyone watching online here in the Philippines and abroad. Welcome to the Development Academy of the Philippines Public Sector Productivity Webinars. My name is Gerard Paul Calambro. I will be your moderator. Let me introduce Sir Michael Sarabia. Good afternoon, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you all in this uh, webinar session. So we also would like to give a shout out to our following agencies who will be watching this afternoon. Let us say hi to the Subic Bay Metropolitan Authority, the National Economic Development Authority, the Department of Public Works and Highways, the Department of Science and Technology, the City Government of Tanawan, Batangas, and the Department of Interior and Local Government. Thank you for watching. So as the Center of Excellence on Public Sector Productivity, the DAP is hosting this webinar series. So today we will dive into the specific tools and techniques that may help you in the public sector to kickstart your everyday productivity, even more so during these pandemic times. So again, we would like to welcome our resource speaker, the Chief Firecracker of the Kick Fire Kitchen, Mr. David O'Hagan. Good afternoon, David. Hi, good afternoon, Gerard and Mike. All right, so uh, take it away, sir. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for having me today. I'm really excited to be here and to speak to everyone about this topic. I I'm pretty passionate about this topic. I think there's so much, uh, so much interest in it as well as so much power in it to uh, achieve greater and, and at times prolific productivity. What we're going to do here at a very high level is uh, an introduction. I'm going to talk about productivity and the public sector as in an overview. And then the two main chunks of the presentation are around personal purpose or why, as well as productivity hacks. That's the approach. And as a quick introduction beyond what Gerard and Mike shared, uh, again, the chief firecracker at Kickfire Kitchen, we help businesses and organizations solve their challenges. Uh, we're a big believer in co-creation. So we work together with those organizations to come up with ideas and solutions and innovations to help solve their challenges using a range of unique uh, and interesting methodologies. We're a big believer also in creating culture, culture that's just uh, furthers and emphasizes creativity, engagement, collaboration across organizations. Just really briefly, we've worked with a range of organizations in the Philippines, with also within Asia, using methodologies to help them solve their challenges, whether it be around sales, whether it be around customer service, whether it be around human resources, a range of organizations that we have worked with. So for today, I'm gonna to share with you some tools and some hacks when it comes to productivity. In addition to that, or even more important than that, I want to, I really encourage you to think, go deep into who you are as a person, because a lot of productivity comes from understanding ourselves better. So I hope that some of the things that I say prompt you to reflect on who you are and where you are in terms of yourself, in terms of your colleagues, your organization, because all of that can uncover interesting and valuable uh, opportunities to be more productive in the end. So I really encourage you to think and reflect not only as I'm going through this, but after the session as well. So much growth and understanding for ourselves happens when we pause and we take the time to reflect on where we are, where we've come from, and also where we're going. In addition to that, an output of that that I, I really want to encourage is what I'll call like a rush or a high or an aha moment that will come out of either something that might happen in what we discussed today or beyond that through your thinking and reflection, that, that excitement, that energy. And for me, if someone was to ask me, is there a magic bullet to productivity? Then I would say it is that rush or that high that people can get, that most people love that energy when they achieve something, when they complete something, when they discover a new perspective or a new way to serve. Uh, so that for me is, is a really strong belief. In all of that, when you have a better understanding of yourself, the tools and the hacks, they work better because we know ourselves better and we can generate that, that momentum in that rush that comes from achieving something. So that's my approach today. It's a little bit unconventional, but I hope you bear with me as we go through it because I think there's some really interesting approaches here that I've used, uh, we've used with our clients, I've used in one-on-one -on -one coaching and a lot of uh, great insight that's come from research and study as well as engagement directly with 
teams and individuals. All right, so I'm gonna jump right into it. There's a fair bit that I wanna cover, but I wanna make sure I go deep enough in it uh, as much as we can in this short session and give you that, an overview, a bit of a teaser almost of these different approaches. And, uh, and then I'll follow up at the end with some opportunities to connect as well as share some more of these resources in detail. So if you're ready to go, I hope you've had a coffee, it's, uh, but I look forward to the engagement. There will be a couple of opportunities for you to engage with me, and I really hope that you take advantage of those, both through some polls that will run, as well as an actual opportunity to share, to come on camera and share with me, and I'll, and I'll prompt you at those points, and I hope we have some, uh, some people that are eager for some afternoon sharing as we go. So just to start off, I'm gonna talk about productivity and what it is. That's the focus here. And I like the word prolific because it's really pushing the limits of it, really extending productivity. There's three definitions of productivity. You'll notice that they deal with the use of resources, output and input in, in the relationship of those, efficiency and use of those. Those are very common definitions of productivity. The problem though with that is the definitions are a little bit boring. And when it comes to productivity, when it comes to performing better, uh, having more of an impact, usually if things are boring, they don't have as much effect. So what I'm gonna do, what I wanna do here today is look at this definition. This is my definition of productivity. The momentum and the rush, that's the girl on the other slide, that's the rush, the energy, the excitement that you get when you've accomplished purposeful tasks. And not just tasks for the sake of doing tasks, but purposeful ones, ones that have meaning, ones that have impact. So to me, it's the momentum and that rush. That's what generates real productivity, and that's what builds on top of itself and allows you to perform, be more productive yourself, as well as share with others. So a big part of this, and in the intro video, there was the talk about sharing, and I love that because a lot of this, when it comes to productivity and practical ways to be more productive, sharing with others is a great way to do it because you can share with them useful ways, but you can also ideate on that and you can fine tune an approach or change it, maybe to use with your team or with your colleagues or even with your spouse or, or family. So that momentum and rush, that's that big driver that I wanna get at with these uh, approaches. Just briefly on, on the public sector, almost a definition of that, we're looking at different organizations and entities. Uh, governments, of course, public sector agencies, uh, publicly backed, publicly managed enterprises or other entities, as well as contractors and businesses that are all delivering public programs or goods and services. The I want to just touch on that because of the point that in the end, all of this, uh, whether it's me from the private sector or yourselves in, in different public sector uh, organizations or entities, ultimately we're all an interconnected group of humans. I think sometimes we forget that, that, that we're human. And we also are emotional. We get stressed at times. We have egos sometimes. And those can get in the way of our, our engagement with others. So I, in most of the work that I do, I'm always looking at that human level, at the core of who we are. Because if we can understand ourselves better and other human beings, we can typically have a bigger impact on what we do and where we work and ultimately on productivity as well. Now, when it comes to reforming public sector, when it comes to re uh, increasing productivity, as we go, there's sort of two paths or two boxes, if you will, that we can, uh, that, that are there and that exist. The one on the left is more the enterprise level, the system change in reform and opportunities. And on the right, it's the individuals, it's us as those humans. And on the left, the enterprise level, there are programs when it comes to productivity, digital uh, transformation programs, implementations that are underway. These are great, but they're big. They, they take time, they take a lot of resources to implement, and we need them. And, and many of you may be involved in some of those, and as they get implemented and rolled out, you, you um, benefit from the result that comes from those. But the other side of it, the human side, which in many ways runs in parallel, are the attitudes that we have and the perspectives that, that we hold on to, as well as enthusiasm that we can either generate and use or not. So for me, obviously on the right side, we have more control over that. Whereas the left side, the enterprise level, that's contributing to us in our work and your work in the public sector and to your productivity. Again, I wanna keep coming back to the individual side and that's where I'm focused on here, but not purely the individual, but the individual in the sense that we can 
improve who we are and how we engage and share with others and collectively have a bigger impact on what we do and who we serve. We, we can't have a discussion about this without talking about the environment that we're currently in, in this pandemic right now. It's really been a shock to the system, the, the world, the country, our organizations. But at the same time, it, it is an opportunity. It can be an opportunity to take advantage of, really as a, as a pivot point to take stock of where we are and step up our productivity, our engagement, our collaboration with others. So I really hope that all of us or many of us can take advantage of this time that we're in, despite the fact that the challenges that it brings and that, that we're all faced with in, diff in differing ways. And the needs of the public are greater than ever in the situation that we've been in, particularly with lockdowns here in the Philippines, as well as on the other parts of the world. So again, from an action perspective, we can choose to sit back and say, well, I'm struggling here. I, I don't know what to do. I, I want others to serve. I want others to step up. Or we can take on that approach ourselves. We can take action. And some of the actions that we can take that are going to stimulate or generate that momentum and that rush that I was referring to in my definition are things like listening and empathy. Empathy is such a powerful tool that allows us to really genuinely understand the needs of others, the needs of the public, the needs of our teammates, the, the needs of our organization. And genuinely understanding that, taking the time to use empathy and, and genuinely listening can go such a long way to understanding what those needs are, understanding why people act and react in certain ways. Agility and flexibility, of course, you'll hear that a lot. That's so important now because many of us are in a work from home environment. It's not business as usual in that sense. So moving away from stereotypes in rigid roles is a great way to do that. And breaking down barriers that are often actually artificial barriers and not giving in to what's in front of us, but saying, I'm going to be enthusiastic about taking this on or exploring how I can make a change for the better, for the organization, for the citizens of this country and my organization. And the idea of leading and leading without a title, I love that concept because leaders can come in in many, many forms. They can have titles. They can be a president or vice president, manager and others, but anyone can lead. And this right now in this pandemic that we're in, it's such a great opportunity to step up and lead. And you might say, well, I don't know, or I don't have an opportunity to do that. But this is also the opportunity to say, I'm going to figure that out. I'm going to take the initiative to look at ways within my team, within the sector that I serve, whatever that might be, that I can make a difference. And I can get creative about that to not only boost productivity, but to boost the results in the resources that are available to the public and to citizens. And with that, there's an opportunity to partner. And maybe those are unconventional partnerships. This is also an opportunity to be creative about how you engage whether it's someone in a different organization, a different government agency, or someone in a different role that then you're normally involved in. There's opportunities to connect and collaborate and to even champion causes. So I encourage you here today to really push back against resistance that might say, well, it's got to stay the same or we've got to just do what we've always been doing because there's always opportunities, pandemic or otherwise. And in the end, the people that step up and look at ways to really have an impact are the ones ultimately that lead effectively and inspire others. In so much of our lives, we're inspired by other people. If we can be one of those in inspiring people, we can make a much bigger difference. And I just showed the these photos from last year. Uh, it was one year ago today. We did a design sprint with the AP. And I, I show this to, to bridge those two paths. There's the enterprise level. So this was a design sprint with the leadership. But at the same time, part of what I like about these innovation programs is that there are tools and pieces that people can use in their day-to-day -day job. As much as it was a organizational program, a design sprint focused on innovation, that there are tools, whether it's different types of ideation or simple rapid prototyping that can be done that you can take back to your team. So it's the individual but it's also the organization. And, and again, I'm encouraging you to always look at ways to have an impact on yourself, starting with yourself, to then inspire others and go beyond that. Okay, so here we are today, we're in a pandemic still, and we're a collection of humans. So we have an opportunity, an opportunity to pivot. Maybe today, maybe you, you, maybe you took advantage of that last month or two months ago because of the situation that we're in. But I wanna make this session today also an encouragement to assess where you're at, and that's what some of the hacks that we're going to look at are geared to. But I also want it to take an opportunity to really be creative. One of my favorite words 
that I, I was introduced to a couple of years ago is the word burstiness. You might have heard it before, but if you didn't, it's really just when people come together, other humans, and build off one another's ideas. The burstiness is ideas, like popcorn that starts popping when ideas are being shared and built on. So someone says, well, we, we've been dealing with uh, the citizens the, in, in the city, and they're always running into this block or this hurdle that we have. And I was thinking, I've got, I've got an idea about that. What do you think? So it's just a casual conversation. It doesn't have to be a formal brainstorming session. And I build off that and I say, ah, oh, that's a great idea. If we involve this group or we do this, then we can build on that. So that's that burstiness. Those ideas start popping and building off one another as they go. And the advantage of that is in that burstiness, ideas come and ideas get built upon. And ultimately, innovations can come out of that. And even further, a culture change. And when I talk about culture here, I'm talking about people that take it on themselves to regularly share ideas with one another. And not every idea is going to work. Not every idea is perfect. But if someone shares an idea with someone else and someone else can build on top of that, then they make it a little bit better. And then they can share it with someone else and build on top of that. And that's ultimately, if you look at history, where a lot of ideas came from. People rarely have a brilliant idea and they can immediately implement it. Lots of things never um, resulted out of simply that. So I encourage you to use burstiness and be bursty in your engagement with colleagues. To say, like, to take opportunities to share ideas and encourage others to share ideas with one another. As a result, in the end, it becomes that bursty environment becomes, it's fun, it's enjoyable to be in, and ideas and results come out of it. And just one last note on that. This is a, a, a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, and I, I, I really like it. Great minds discuss ideas, that's the top tier. Average minds discuss events. And then at the low end, small minds discuss people. My encouragement here to you is I often equate, and you might agree or disagree, but social media, which I'm not against, but social media is a lot of just about people in sharing, liking, commenting about people. That's discussing people. So my encouragement to you is at times, put your phone aside, put social media aside, and take the opportunity to engage with your colleagues, with your, with your family members, and just say, what, what are your thoughts today? Where, what have you done or what ideas do you have? Because it's then more ideas come and that burstiness can come out of it as well. So it's just a, a friendly suggestion that swap out some of your social media time with ideas and sharing. Because ideas come to fruition and evolve even better when you've done it in uh, collectively, when you bring people together to do that. Productivity is not always easy. When we think about productivity at, the, at a, again, an enterprise level, a system level, or in the public sector in general, there's a number of things that can hold it back or make it difficult or slow it down. Leadership is one. They're often top management have to support and give direction to programs. Um, if that's not there, it takes longer or it's slower or things don't, don't work as they're intended to, even if there's good motivation behind it. Resources are all scarce much of the time. They're required for systems themselves to, to implement them, for training on them, for equipment and, and, and other elements. So that, that's another common thing that can slow down productivity in the public sector. And people and cultures, again, we're talking about people, we're humans. Not everyone, myself included, is always as open-minded as I probably should be. I'm always pushing myself to remain open-minded, to look at it with a beginner's mind and explore new ideas. But even if people think that their job is at threat because of a new system that's gonna be in place, whether that's true or not, people can resist that or not be as open to it. So we wanna, again, focus on ourselves and say, are, are we using empathy enough? Are we open-minded enough? Are we exploring opportunities together? And then individually, productivity can also be difficult. Because of productivity is, is fairly intangible, it's not really taught in school, it's not a subject. Uh, so that makes it more difficult. It's not really often taught on the job here in the Philippines, uh, in Canada, where I'm from, or in many other countries. Uh, there are a number of courses now, like on Udemy, LinkedIn Learning, and things that offer uh, productivity courses. But what happens there often is those programs, they're either too complex or they're not practical enough. They're too theoretical to actually get applied. I'm so obsessive about practicality. And that's also why in the hacks I'm going to show you in a while, that's where that is focused as well, is being ultra practical. The more practical, the more tangible it is, the more likely it's going to get implemented and done. The third point here is we often don't know ourselves well enough. 
And many of us have quirks that can get in the way of our own productivity. So that goes back to my comment in the beginning with Rodin and the thinker sculpture is take the time. It's, it's a well worth the investment to reflect on who we are, where we are, why we resist things, and, and then how can we be better at being open uh, when it comes to productivity in, in our other areas. And we're very distracted. Our lives are busy. Uh, again, we're very distracted in this work from home pandemic environment. It's not really an excuse. It can be used as an excuse, but we can also look beyond that and say, what can I do here? How can I engage with others to improve what I do, to improve the offerings that my uh, agency or my organization offers? Just before we get into deeper into productivity, we want to do a quick word cloud just to get a sense from everyone for them here in the session. And we're going to have a, uh, a mentee screen come up. And the question is, what are your biggest obstacles to productivity in the public sector? So we're looking for open-ended responses uh, on this. And to give us a sense from the 1,100 or so people that are here is what are your obstacles when it comes to productivity? Attitude, mediocrity, apathy, lack of manpower, attitude, technology, budget, finances, red tape, rules. Good. So as you can see, there's, there's a bit of a, a balance again between things that whether it's red tape, whether it's rules, bureaucracy that we don't have as much control over, but things like attitude, it's right up there. Workload is an interesting one. Uh, culture plays a part. So attitude, again, is still big where we have control over that. And that's what I want to direct you to today. I'm not dismissing the difficulties and the, and the restrictions to productivity that come with the organization or the organizational bureaucracy and, and budget and, and all of those. So culture is a big one, which again, culture is an interesting one because cultures are always there regardless of, of whether we like it or not. Cultures will form, they'll become toxic if they're allowed to, or they can go, they can go the other way. But they, we can also as individuals really have an impact. Attitudes pretty big still, um, which, which is a big part, which is interesting because, well, it's interesting because we have, we have a lot of control over our attitude, which is good. The culture is still up high. So we'll just go for a few more responses. Thank you for everyone for submitting those. So bureaucracy, budget, red tape, those are still pretty large. Mindset um, comes back in, which is also a good one. And at, for those that are, that are entering those ones, such as attitude, mindset, I hope that although you're you're recognizing that as the biggest obstacle, I hope that that those same people are also looking to say, well, can I change this? Can, what can I do to impact my attitude around this? Can I am I going to play a victim? And I'm not saying anyone is, but that's one approach. We can just allow this pandemic and this environment to push us down, or we can say, here's my opportunity. Here's our opportunity to make it make a difference within what we do. All right, so we had 162 responses. Thanks everyone for that attitude is right up there at the top. Culture, bureaucracy, culture and attitude, corruption. All right, okay, so thanks for that. Okay, so now I wanna talk about what's good about productivity and why it's good and why it's oh so good. Uh, and I really believe it is. And I like to represent it as this wheel. And surrounding the wheel, as you can see, there's a number of words. These words aren't always perfectly in that order, and that's, that's fine, that's normal. Uh, but if you start at the bottom, you've got action. In order to, to be productive, to produce something, to achieve something, you've got to take action. If you're not taking action, then you're, you're not really going to get anywhere. If you take action and then you get demotivated as a result, then the action stalls and you're not making much progress. But when you take action, it might take a few attempts. You're generating some progress, and progress feels good. And this is where we think, all right, okay, I, I, I was stuck there or I was frustrated with this, but I've, I've made some progress on it now. So now I'm moving. Now I'm generating some momentum. When you create momentum, then momentum, you can then create habits. And habits are such a powerful component of productivity. And habits is the shift of thinking from your conscious mind to your subconscious mind. And I'm going to be talking later about subconscious mind. But when you make that shift from the conscious mind to the subconscious mind, it becomes a habit. It becomes second nature to you. So you don't have to consciously think about doing it. And that's so excellent when it comes to productivity. You start becoming different. Your, your patterns and behaviors change 
and they start working towards a more productive one. And as when that happens, you start getting successes. And with success comes confidence. And confidence is that really interesting thing that is so intangible, that's even harder to teach, but it's a result of those activities. And again, it's not a perfect sequence. They can come in different orders and it's great if they do, but that's, that's how it builds. And that's what, when you're taking action on, on things, whether it's a repetitive task or whether you're creating a new, you're starting out on a new project or you're exploring a way that you can create something new for your organization and have a bigger impact. You're taking action in the beginning. You're deciding to take that action, which is the first step. On this, when you get this wheel, it's a wheel, so it rolls, right? So when it keeps rolling, that's really positive because then you're inspired to, to generate more momentum, to take more action in those things. And that when a wheel is rolling, it's harder to slow down. So that momentum is going. We all know people who are just really enthusiastic and just have a lot of successes, but a lot of times it's because they're putting in the effort to make that and to be productive in what they do. And trial and error is a big part. The second part of that is the universality of it. Because as you generate momentum and create habits, when it comes to your work life, those same approaches in your brain, in your work style, in your personality, apply to every other area of your life. So you can be productive when it comes to your family. You can be productive when it comes to volunteering that you do. When it comes to your own health, you develop good habits and, and the, the routine to get a habit locked in applies to your work, to your personal life, to every other area of your life. So that's so great because you become good in one area, you can apply the same concepts in another. And then there's the ripple effect, which is a result off of that. Whereas if you're, if I'm having success, I'm being productive because I, I've put in the effort and I'm generating that momentum in what I do, I'm going to be happier. I'm going to be more confident. I'm going to enjoy life more. I'm going to get more of those rushes, that high that I was referring to before. And if I'm like that, people around me are going to appreciate that. My spouse, my kids, my friends, they're going to want to be around me more. If I come home from work or if I'm working in the bedroom and I come out of the bedroom at the end of work, then uh, people are, are going to appreciate me. They're going to like to be around me more. We all know people that, have, that are confident, that are, that are engaging, that enjoy, to, that we enjoy being around them. So that's that ripple effect. We're, we're positively impacting those around us, kids, family, other colleagues, and, and so on. So now I'm going to get into what I call somewhat jokingly the gorgeous solution. So I'm going to talk a bit more practical now about the two key parts of the session today, your purpose or your why, and then the practical brain or life hacks. This is the approach. I, I do this partly because of different learning styles, different personalities to appeal more broadly, talking about purpose and talking about the practical hacks. But the other thing I will say on the purpose side is that if you understand your purpose better, your reason why you exist, that makes everything better. The, the hacks that you want to apply, the way you engage with people, the way that you share ideas, it's all, it just comes alive more. So the first one is your purpose or your why. And that's really why we exist, why we are on this earth. A lot of people have never thought about this concept, um, but it's a very powerful one. And I would argue it's one of the most powerful things that you could do. And it's also a journey. It's not a one-time thing. You suddenly, okay, I know what my purpose is. You can, and you can get to that, but it's also something that you want to do and refine over time. And the quote by Jim Rohn, which is a great one, is the bigger the why, the easier the how. The clearer and the more inspiring your purpose or your why is, it just automatically becomes easier to how to figure it out, how to implement it, how to do it, how to, and then as a result, you become more productive. So we're going to do a quick poll before we get into this. And the, the, the poll question is, are you familiar with Simon Sinek's Golden Circle? This is what I'm basing the purpose or the why conversation on. And I'll, I'll explain a bit about it for those that are not familiar. But you're welcome then now to poll or to uh, respond to the poll. And okay, so there's a good number that I've never heard of it, which I like because there's a potential there that all of those right now, 70% of people have never come across it. There's a potential for those people to understand it and embrace it and have a life changing impact as a result. And there's 1% that's saying, yes, I'm living out my why. That's awesome as well. Um, so just give a, a couple more seconds to respond to that. So it's looking pretty consistent. About 70% of the people have not heard of it. 20% sounds familiar. 6% uh, have seen the TED Talk. So it's a TED Talk. It was done about 10 years ago. This is Simon Sinek. This is what made him essentially famous for this golden circle concept. 
Uh, and what's so interesting about this concept is it's so simple, yet it's so powerful. The focus is the why, but the golden circle, as you can see, is why in the center and then how and what. So he explains it in the TED Talk, but I encourage you to watch it. If you've seen it before, because 6% of you have seen it, I encourage you to watch it again. I've watched it many times and I, and I find it inspiring and motivating every time that I, that I watch it. As it turns out, there's a pattern. As it turns out, all the great and inspiring leaders and organizations in the world, whether it's Apple or Martin Luther King or the Wright brothers, they all think, act, and communicate the exact same way, and it's the complete opposite to everyone else. All I did was codify it, and it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done, that's how most sales is done, and that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do, we say how we're different or how we're better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. Nobody bought one. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. The goal is not to do business with, anybody, with everybody who needs what you have. The goal is to do business with people who believe what you believe. Here's the best part. None of what I'm telling you is my opinion. It's all grounded in the tenets of biology, not psychology, biology. If you look at a cross-section of the human brain looking from the top down, what you see is the human brain is actually broken into three major components that correlate perfectly with the golden circle. Our newest brain, our homo sapien brain, our neocortex, corresponds with the what level. The neocortex is responsible for all of our rational and analytical thought and language. The middle two sections make up our limbic brains, and our limbic brains are responsible for all of our feelings, like trust and loyalty. It's also responsible for all human behavior, all decision-making, and it has no capacity for language. In other words, when we communicate from the outside in, yes, people can understand vast amounts of complicated information like features and benefits and facts and figures. It just doesn't drive behavior. When we communicate from the inside out, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then we allow people to rationalize it with the tangible things we say and do. This is where gut decisions come from. 
You know, sometimes you can give somebody all the facts and your figures and they say, I know what all the facts and details say, but it just doesn't feel right. Why would we use that verb? It doesn't feel right. Because the part of the brain that controls decision making doesn't control language. And the best we can muster up is, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Or sometimes you say you're leading with your heart or you're leading with your soul. Well, I hate to break it to you, those aren't other body parts controlling your behavior. It's all happening here in your limbic brain, the part of the brain that controls decision making and not language. But if you don't know why you do what you do, and people respond to why you do what you do, then how will anybody how will you ever get people to, 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 to vote for you or buy something from you, or more importantly, be loyal and want to be a part of what it is what you, that you do? Again, the goal is not just to sell people who need what you have. The goal is to sell to people who believe what you believe. So to, to summarize it, what he's saying is organizations as well as people have a why or a purpose. And the way most organizations and people communicate, though, is they talk about their what, which is on the, on the outside of the circle. Few organizations and people talk about their why. And he says that everyone knows what they do, whether it's themselves or their organization that they work for. It's clear, it's easy. Uh, it's your job description if, if, if you're a, an individual. Less, less people know how they do it. And when, when how relates to what's unique about you or what's different about the way you do your job or the way that you engage. But the why is really the reason for being. It's the core of who you are. It answers that question, why am I here on this earth? So a quick story from me. Um, when I was 33 years old, which to me is fairly late in life, to start understanding about my why or my purpose here. And it was after I had gone to university, I'd worked in a number of jobs. I went back to university to get a master's and I was working in a technology company and I was living in Florida and I was about to make another change because I just wasn't satisfied. None of the jobs I'd had up to that point in my life were fulfilling or motivating to me. Uh, I came across a life coach at the church I was going to and I started working with him and he started working, he started working with me. I started understanding how coaching works and for the very first time in my life, at 33 years old, I thought, wow, I think I could do this. I, I this coaching thing seems really interesting to me. And I thought, this could be it. Uh, so I ended up coaching with him, I ended up getting certified as, as a coach and becoming a, a coach. But it was that was the, the turning point for me at 33 years old, which I think is pretty late to, for the first time, get a sense of, of who I am and why I'm here. But it all started to really make sense at that point. So whether you're 33, whether you're younger or older, uh, getting an understanding and thinking about your why and your purpose goes such a long way in so many areas of your life when it comes to productivity, as well as joy and impact in every other area of your life as well. So this is connected to the brain, the why, how, and the what. So as a super quick biology lesson, the what corresponds to the neocortex part of the brain, and the why and the how is the limbic brain. So this isn't just a theory that Simon came up with, it's based on, on biology. So if you're not familiar with the neocortex, it's responsible for thinking and making sense of things. The limbic brain is responsible for emotions and feelings, as well as decision-making. That's not the neocortex, which is really interesting. Uh, so he talks about in the video, when we do things or when we're thinking about things, we often, when we, when we're unsure about something, the common response is, I just don't know. It doesn't feel right. And that's because it's coming, that's our limbic brain uh, working and it's giving us a sense either for something or against something. Uh, so the brain is at work and the brain is connected or the limbic brain is connected to the why in that area. So in the, vi in the video, he talks about Apple, the, the company, because one, it's their, their example is easy to understand, but it is also... Apple does a really good job of speaking from their why, coming from their why. So what, what he says is, or what, how he breaks down Apple is their what, again, where most people go from, is they make great computers and other devices. And the how, what's unique to Apple, is they're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. So Apple does do a very good job of those things. But the why of Apple, 
The reason they exist as an organization is to challenge the status quo. And as you can see in the history of Apple, they've really done that. They've changed the way we use devices and the way we use technology. And the other part of their why is to think differently. And it explains also why Apple's just like many other tech companies that create devices, but very few other companies have people that camp out overnight the day before the next iPhone is launched to be the first to get it. Because people are connecting, their limbic brain is connecting with the why of Apple. Because they think, well, if, if I have this device, which is beautifully designed, simple to use and user friendly, that's all great from a device perspective. But if I'm an owner of one of these devices, I'm going to be seen as a challenger to the status quo. I'm going to be seen as someone that thinks differently. So that's, that's why it's so powerful here and as from an organization perspective. And that's what in many ways differentiates Apple from others and has proven to be why they're so successful. So I'll give you a, a, an individual example for myself. I'll just show you briefly how I break it down. So for me, my what, again, the very simple, very understandable part of what we do is I facilitate workshops and do consulting. So there's lots of people that do that. It's interesting. I love it. But that's just the what. The how for me in how at Kickfire, how we do it is we're mashing up different methodologies. So we use the Lego serious play method. We combine that with design thinking and innovation method. We incorporate storytelling into that. We often talk about why and purpose in those sessions. So we're customizing or mashing up these methodologies to deliver the best results for our clients, for the teams or people that we're working with. So that's more interesting. And that's what separates us from some of our other competitors. But for me personally, the why for me is to kickstart that inner fire in every person so that they're joyfully pursuing their greatest potential. That's what gets me out of bed in the morning. That's what fires me up. It's not the workshops. It's not doing webinars like this today. I love doing this. I love the opportunity to share with others and to help others improve, be more productive, be more creative in whatever they do. But the fact that I could have an impact to stoke the fire inside a person so they get excited about life, they get motivated, they're, they're passionate about what they do, and they're pursuing their greatest potential, that's what motivates me most. And that's a differentiator for me. So that's how it can break down. And that's what I encourage all of you to do, uh, to think about yourself in that way. As I said, it's not always, it, it's a bit of a, an ongoing journey to define what your why is and ultimately to uh, live it out. But it makes a big difference. And that's why I'm always looking at ways to be creative in how I can stoke that fire. And it also allows me, when I talk about that why, to connect with other people that are like that. Not everyone in life is passionate about what they do, and that's okay. But I am looking for people that are interested in pursuing greater impact, in, in reaching people in different ways. So when I talk about uh, kickstarting that inner fire, I can more easily connect with people that are, have a similar desire. When I talk about workshops and consulting, not as much, because not everyone that delivers workshops or does consulting is necessarily wanting to ignite that fire within people. Okay, so I want to just turn it over to you for a moment. Uh, and there's an option on your screen that's called request to speak. So I want to just, just briefly ask for some volunteers that would be open to sharing their why. Either you've thought about it before and you have a why already, or you're, you're intrigued by the idea and you're bold enough to share that why with us here. So the moderators will give you an opportunity to come on camera and speak and share it. You can also use the chat. I'm okay with that. But I would say that we call it a bold proclamation in, in workshops, in, in work that we do with people, in, in helping them define their why, that they boldly proclaim it. Because when you do that, there's power behind it. Hearing yourself say your why, your reason for being, it drives you, it motivates you. And it's great to hear, for other people to hear that as well. Hi. Oh, got someone. All right. Yes. Hi. Good. Mo good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes. Uh, um. I. 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 I chatted. Uh. The. Uh, my question. Why do we keep. Uh. Waking up every morning. So part of it was just a mere joke, but it's really about our daily life. So okay. in in our company, which I work from, I'm from the Philippine National Police. We have this application that we need to wake up early and to uh, have our attendance check. So the joke go, uh, goes like this. Um, we only wake up for the daily attendance for the Philippine National Police because most of us are working from home 
And on my part, on my personal part, um, I woke up because I needed to work and to take care of my children. So it's the wise that makes me keep going. Okay. That's all. Great. All right. Well, thanks for sharing. And yes. Yeah. The, the world that we're in, we've got demands and requirements on us. We need to support families and things like that, which is all, which is all great. Uh, but my, my encouragement as well is to think, okay, what is, what, even though it's a requirement, you've got to get up, you've got to sign in and all of that. But what's the reason for you, if you boil it all down to, to see who, to think about who you are in life, not necessarily thinking about your job because you've got a family, you're, you're also a mother, I presume, and there's other, other elements to do with that. So there, there's still, there's a deeper why or a deeper purpose that, that exists. If you can find that, then in an optimistic sense, another side of that would be then you, you jump out of bed in the morning because you're excited to go to work because of the impact that your job is having. So it's not so much, oh, I've got to get up because I have to get to work, I have to sign in. It's I'm doing something that's serving the country. I'm helping my colleagues. I'm helping the police force, whatever, whatever that might be. That's my encouragement there to go deeper in that. Because if you do, you're, you're likely, it's not a guarantee, but you're likely to get out of bed with a bigger smile in the morning or to go to work thinking, I can have a bigger impact today. Uh, in what I do. So that's my encouragement. Well, thanks for sharing. Hi. Yes. Hi, good afternoon, yeah. everyone. Um, I'm from the Tourism Promotions Board. And um, basically, my why, uh, what what drives me every day to go to work is um, I have this passion to promote the Philippines to other countries. And how do I do that is through the different activities that we have in our office. So let's say, for example, we have different promotional activities like we have familiarization trips, we have promotions online, and that drives me to do my best in my job. And actually, as a market specialist, I can say that I have really immersed myself in the market, which was assigned to me. I'm not really sure about the, the what. I'm a bit confused. Is that something tangible? Or... Yeah, so that's basically your job description, the tasks that you do make up the work. Yeah. Yes, um, so my what would be as a market specialist, I have to promote the Philippines. And why do I do that? Because I find the Philippines a very beautiful country, and it's a shame not to share it with the others. So in sharing the Philippines, in promoting the Philippines to others, I also wanted others to see that we have a very beautiful country, but we also have to protect this country. So it also comes with responsible tourism. That's also part of my job. So it's basically loving what I'm doing, something like that. So I don't know exactly what to do, <laughs> how to say it, but that's basically my idea. Great. No, that's awesome. Thanks very much for sharing that. And Thank you started you. off saying to promote the Philippines and then, and then you went a bit deeper by saying, because it's a beautiful place and it's a shame not to share it and all of that. So there you're going deeper into your why. So thank you very much for sharing it. And even as you were sharing it, you were getting to the more deeper to the core of where, where you're at and what your why is. Because that, that in, in the end is the essence because uh, that, that's why you do what you do. Um, so my encouragement there is to keep, to keep thinking about that because I don't expect you to have a perfectly refined why, but if you can get to the point where you've got a sentence that describes who you are and the impact that you want to have, then you're going to feel, you're likely to feel even more passionate about what you do and how you can reach more people, whether that's within the Philippines domestically, whether that's overseas and bringing people in when they can come back. So you're thinking about that. So it gets you looking at your how, how can I do this differently? How can I inspire more foreigners to visit here? Is that then different types of programs that we can offer? Can we look at creative ways to share the, the beauty of the country and, and things like that? Thank you so much. All right. Thank you for sharing. I'm Aripa Alonto. So I'm a medical social worker from uh, the Research Institute for Tropical Medicine. It is actually a government hospital under the Department of Health. So uh, considering the why and considering the pandemic that we are in right now, I think my why right now is very, um, very interesting. And because uh, as, as a Christian, you know, in my day to day life, I already I always make it a point to put God my top priority in, in everything I do because I know that without him 
I don't have any sense of why or purpose really in life. And then second is, as a medical social worker, we provide services, social services for those indigent patients, meaning they can't afford or they can't pay their hospital bills. And sometimes it's like half a million or over a million or thousands. Most of our cases are person living with HIV. So I think my, my, my why for them is really not to give them the sense of social service, but the sense of purpose, you know, for them to believe that um, we have medicines, we have uh, different procedures, but at the end of the day, it's, it is really nothing for them because at the end of the day, they will go home and they still feel sick. And they know that at the end of the day, they are dying. But before they leave the office and they feel that they have this sense of purpose that you give them, then it will make them have this sense of strength and hope. The health system or the health services may not work for them, but they still have this sense of purpose. So I think for me as a medical social worker, my why is to provide a sense of purpose and life to these people. And so thank you. That's fantastic. So thank you very much for sharing that. It's amazing. And you, you've really done a nice job of that because you're right. You, 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 you have a job that you do, but it's not about the job. It's about the impact that you're having and, yes. and looking at the people that you work with and helping them see or find or further their purpose. That, that's yes. awesome. Because that, that's exactly then um, what you're going to do. And, that, and that, when it gets tough, when, it, when things are, are, when you're stressed, you can go back to that and, and say, well, I'm, I'm helping these people with a bit. I'm not just being a social worker. I'm helping them find purpose in their life. And, and that's, the, that's the power of the why. That, that's where yeah. you can fall back on at times where you're, you're, you're stressed, you're, you're worried or whatever might come up. Because if you think, well, I'm a social worker. That's my job. I have to do it. Mm -hmm. that, doesn't always, that doesn't always work. That's, that's true. But if you're thinking about remembering that why you're doing this to help others find that purpose and do well in life as a result of your engagement with them. That's awesome. Great. Yes, thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So there's a few other people there, uh, Gerard, but I, I also want to be respectful of time. I'd love to hear it from everyone, but I also want to try to stay on track with time. All right. So thanks everyone for sharing. And again, my, my strong encouragement, and you might be saying, well, why are we talking about purpose when we're talking, when the session's about productivity? Because in the end, like in that example there, when you're thinking about the impact and the purpose that you can help inspire others for, you're going to do your, you're going to be more inspired to do your job. You're going to, you're going to see your job as having a bigger impact. And as a result, there's an indirect and sometimes direct productivity impact because you're going to, you're going to live your life more purposefully which will feed or encourage productivity. So thank you again. This, as I mentioned, there is a worksheet, but these are just three prompts when it comes to the why, how, and what. So if you wanna take a quick photo or screenshot of this, if you're interested in exploring your why, as well as the how and the what, there are some prompts. But as I said, the what is really your job, what you do, which everyone knows. The how is what's unique to you. What sets you apart? It's great to be thinking about that. What does set me apart from other people? whether I'm an employee, whether I have my own business, whatever, whatever that might be. And then again, the why is why you exist, your cause, why anyone should care. Um, so thinking about those in, in those prompts are a great way to deepen your understanding of your why. One other encouragement uh, also is just to really uh, share it with others. Once you've got an idea of your draft why, um, look to then share it with others and see if if they if they can contribute to it or build on top of what you've already done because it's great to hear the thoughts of others because we know ourselves better than anyone else does but we forget things at time or we, we forget things that we're good at which can often contribute to our why or our purpose so i'm going to transition into the second part so we've looked at at why in purpose so now it's the productivity hack. And so my quote that I want to use here is indulge me. So these hacks, as you're going to see in a moment, they're a little bit unconventional as, as well. They're things that I, I've done. I've had success myself in them. I've worked, I've used them with a range of other clients and, and people in my life. They work well and they are backed also by science. But I would say, and the reason I say indulge me is that because we're human, because we have our own quirks and our own personality and work styles, not everything works exactly the same for everyone else. So my encouragement is to, to take it, listen to what I'm going to share and say, how can I make this my own? Or how can I, what can I do with this 
So it really works for me. That's my encouragement in this part as we go through this. So these hacks, I'm gonna share, I should be able to share four quick ones with you. Um, they're all feeding into a book that I'm in the process of writing, which goes into a big, a lot deeper dive into these hacks themselves with stories of how they work, the science behind them, as well as the purpose side of things. So just briefly to get on the same page, a hack that you might've heard of, it's often called a life hack or a brain hack. It's just a, a trick, a shortcut, a technique to do things more effectively, more efficiently, more easily, uh, and be more productive as a result. And it is in many ways a brain hack. You're, you're looking at hacking your own brain to figure out how to do something better or more simply or be more productive as a result. And I'm gonna come back to that subconscious conscious thing because that, that plays a big part here as well. So just one quick one when it comes to, to hacks and what a lot of people struggle with, myself included, is we often see the value in doing something, but we don't know how to do it. There's no structure. So if, we, if we're given a blank page and say, be more productive, that's kind of tough. So these hacks are provide a template, provide structure in very practical prompts, which is a, a good way to get that momentum going to, to take action because it's tangible things you can do. So it's not just staring at a blank page saying, okay, where do I start? I'm just going to give you one example of this. And if you're familiar with Canva, Canva is a great web-based tool for design. And Canva, in many ways, democratized design. Prior to Canva, there were tools like Photoshop and, and, and other Illustrator and tools that you could create and design things with, but they, were, they, were, they can be fairly expensive and there's a learning curve involved. So what Canva did is make that really simple. And part of that, and the reason I bring it up, is there's a lot of templates in there. So on the screen, the screenshot, there's a number of infographics. So if you're saying, I wanna create an infographic, I'm not just starting with a blank page and saying, okay, how do I organize it? How do I structure it? Canva provides a wide range of infographic templates. So I just swap in images, swap out text and build it that way. So again, I bring that up because templates and structure and prompts are a great way to start the movement, start the action that builds that momentum and then that builds those habits ultimately. One other key thing before I get into the hacks is many people, again, myself included, waste time without realizing it. So many of us think, well, I'm really busy. I've got, I've got so much going on. But in the end, we don't actually realize how much time we're wasting in a day or in a week. So part of it, going back to that, again, the reflection and thinking about yourself is when it comes to productivity, part of it is saying, where am I wasting time? Or where am I being less productive? And I mentioned social media before. I'm definitely not against social media, but I also think we spend a lot of time on things like social media that can be a, a great release or a break from the stresses of life or job and everything else. But be cautious and, and just watch how much time you spend on it. And, and being aware of that, that awareness can go a long way. You can almost instantly be more productive simply by cutting out or reducing the amount of time you waste on things. Everyone has different vices. It might be social media, it might be video games, it might be the gym. There, there could be any number of things. They're not, none of them are bad, but we have to be cautious about where we, where we spend too much time. My other, before I get into the first half, one other comment I wanna make, and, and Thomas Edison has got some great quotes. This one saying, I've not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work or that won't work. It's such a great quote, and it, it, it talks to grit and persistence that he doesn't give up. And I bring this up now because as I mentioned with these hacks, you might have to twist them a little bit. You might have to fine tune them a little bit to your personality and your style. And that's what I encourage you to do. Lots of times with self-help books and programs, people get excited at first when they do it. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna take a productivity program. And then they're excited for the first week and then they try some of the activities and they don't really work that well. And so many times the response is, well, that wasn't for me, or I, didn't, I don't like it. When in fact, it's worth trying a couple more times, maybe not 10,000, but trying more times to see what can work. How can I fine tune this to fit my schedule, to fit my personality, to fit my work style, and see if I can make it work. Lastly, and going right back to the, the video in the beginning is about sharing. So I really do believe sharing is caring. A lot of these uh, hacks are geared to individuals, but they're also a great thing to share if you have success with these, as well as to ideate or evolve them 
together, to come up with a way that with your team or with your family, that you can be more productive when it comes to organizing and, and managing time and burstiness again. If one of these hacks uh, you could use uh, with your team at work, or you could evolve it into something different that, that helps you and your team be more productive. Allow some burstiness to happen. Get excited about exploring ideas. Gamifying it's a great way to create competitions out of it. It doesn't have to be an elaborate hackathon, but it can just be a, a, a leaderboard or tracking about who's being most productive or what results, who has had the best results this week. Gamifying things is a great way to engage people and to further the results. Connected to that, storytelling. I'm a big believer in storytelling because it, it makes more tangible the results and the impact that people have. Everyone has a phone, everyone can record videos. You, you become more productive in, in something, you can just record a two minute video saying this is what I did, this is why I did it, and this is the impact that it's had. Or creating visuals or infographics, using Canva even, uh, to do that. And then the idea of a suggestion system, uh, not an elaborate, a formal program, but making it an organic one. Again, going back to that burstiness, creating a culture of idea sharing with your teams across business units, across agencies. Uh, a lot of times people say, well, I don't have time for that. But my encouragement to you today is make time for it because you're going to get connected with other people more. You're going to share ideas more. You're going to make your job more interesting and more fun. And even though many of us are in a work from home environment, we can still share through technology and through apps and through tools that allow us to do that. So to say, well, it's, it's harder now because I'm not face to face. Yes, some things are not as good, but there's still a lot of tools that we have access to that can allow us to share and create ideas. All right, so I'm going to go through the hacks. Um, and I'll, I'll go through each one relatively briefly, but in there, uh, even in the absence of a worksheet, which I will share later uh, with anyone that's interested, the, I do provide the prompts on the slides. So if you're interested in trying these out, there's enough content there to do it. And again, I'm gonna show four uh, of these hacks. I've, I've got about 20 of these that work in different ways that, that address different learning styles and approaches. So the, the five minute hack is a spin off of the Pomodoro technique. If you're familiar with that, it's a, it's a technique that relates to focused work and breaking it down into intervals, typically 25 minute intervals of focused work. So working on one thing for a solid 25 minutes, taking a break, doing another 25 minute session. So it's a spin off of that. And this is how it works. So again, this is ultra practical, ultra simple, and with the interest of just getting it done. Because as I said before, when things are simple and more simple to comprehend and easier to do, you're much more likely to do it. So the hack is called five minutes. The idea behind it is you ensure that in every single day, you find five minutes of time to do something, to progress something. And you might say, well, five minutes is nothing. It is nothing, but it also makes it easier to do. And the reason that, that this is so important is, as I said, I'm writing a book. If I go a week without writing any, anything connected to the book, then after that week, when I, when I come back to it, I've got to spend time remembering where I was at, remembering what I was thinking. Whereas if I even spent just five minutes a day, it's fresh in my mind. And that freshness, that mental momentum is so key. So the practical tips are here, picking time slots. So picking five, like two to three times in your day, where you can have five minutes of undisturbed time. That might be the first thing that when you wake up, it might be after the kids go to bed. It might be when you're waiting for your spouse to finish getting ready. Again, this is where you got, you have to think about yourself and reflect on your, your life and say, where can, I where can I fit these five minutes of time in? You might say, well, I can do 30 minutes. You can, but I recommend starting with five because five is so doable. So in addition to the time slots, picking those, then pick activities that you want to do in those time slots. That could be journaling, that could be just reading, could be working on a podcast, creating content, could be praying, could be any number of things. So pick what those are. And the reason you do this is when that five minute time slot happens, you know exactly what you're going to do. You don't have to think, okay, what am I going to spend my time on and waste four minutes figuring that out. And then the third part to this hack, again, it's very simple, is just to schedule it in. So I might say, First thing when I wake up, 6 a.m., Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 
I'm going to spend that first five minutes of waking. And on Monday, I'm going to journal. On uh, Wednesday, I'm going to read a, a, a business book. And on Friday, I'm going to I'm going to work on my podcast. So you know exactly when your timer goes off or when your calendar notification pops up, what you're going to do on each of those days. That is ultra critical to make it happen is having the exact time slot set, look, putting it in your calendar and having the activities ready to go. It makes a huge difference in making progress. This is the pool in my, in my building where I swim every morning. So what happens is, and how I've used this to give you a personal example of the five minute hack is I swim at eight o'clock every morning. At 7.45, uh, my calendar shows me a notification saying, get ready to swim. So what I've done is I've implemented a five minute time slot right at 7.45 to work on something. In my case, often it's writing, but it can be any number of things, whatever you wanna do, whatever makes you feel good, whatever makes you feel productive in, in making progress. So now what I do is, in addition to swimming every morning, which gives me the health benefits and, and wakes me up and, and all of that, I also get five minutes of work in on the writing. And a good side benefit of this is your brain doesn't really do a good job of distinguishing between five minutes of work and 30 minutes of work. So what happens is after I finish swimming, I come back upstairs, I've not only had my physical fitness for the day, but I've also done five minutes of writing. And again, it's five minutes, but it's better than nothing. And it's better than, it's a lot better than letting multiple days or even a week go by before I start writing again. So that's the five minute hack. It's nothing more complex than that. Again, I encourage you to indulge me in thinking, okay, give it a try. Pick the, um, pick the time slots, pick the activities and put it in your calendar. And all the hacks are, are similar to this very simple approach. Okay, the second hack, I'm gonna move on to this one. It's called top of mind. And this is again where we, where we get into the brain and the conscious and the subconscious mind. If you're, if you're familiar with the subconscious mind, it's much more powerful than your conscious mind. It never sleeps, unlike your conscious mind, because it regulates your breathing, your heart, it's managing all of that. And it's much more powerful. So this is tapping into or making use of your subconscious mind through this top of mind hack. Now there's, a, there's a, an effect that was described, I think in the 1950s or 60s, called the mere exposure effect. And what it says is when people are familiar with something, they just prefer it. And they've done tests on this when it comes to um, music, to bands, when it comes to drinks like cola, like Coke or Pepsi. If you're just exposed to something more, you just start preferring it. It's just part of the way our brain works for better or for worse. So this hack is building off of that and the subconscious mind. This hack, from a practical perspective, you have to do, just do two things. Pick the activities in the items, as well as the location. Top of mind is really good because it's tapping into your subconscious mind. Top of mind is what marketers want when it comes to products. The more a, a customer, the more a, a consumer sees something, the more familiar they are with it, and the more comfortable they're with it. So it's playing off of that side of our brain. So fr from the hack perspective, I'll give you an example of journaling. So I, I really like, I really value journaling. And the, um, so what I do, the way I do it is I journal every night before I go to bed. I capture the successes during the day and I capture what I wanna do tomorrow. It's a great way to plan for tomorrow so I don't wake up thinking, okay, what do I have to do? I didn't have to figure it out. I've already planned it out the night before. The issue with that though is at the end of the day, you're typically tired and your willpower declines throughout the day. If you have less willpower, you're less motivated to do things. So this hack, the way I use it, is my physical journal. It's one of the few things I use uh, analog. I write in a paper journal. I put it, when I wake up, I put it on my bed. So it's there when I go to bed, when I'm getting ready to go to bed the next the, that night. So the advantage of that is top of mind, and it's right there. Because if I have to remember to write in my journal, I, I may forget. I can use a calendar notification, but it's also easy to dismiss those. The physical journal sitting on my bed is much harder to dismiss. So it's possible if I'm really tired, I see the journal and I'm like, uh, I pick it up and put it off to the side. But the fact I have to pick it up is almost enough to convince me that I may as well just write in it. So that's making it really in your face, top of mind. So the hack here is pick things like a journal or a to-do list, 
or the next hack is around visioning. So a vision statement. Um, pick what those are. And again, it can be an activity like journaling or it can be a physical journal and choose where you're going to put them. The journal is on my bed. A refrigerator door is a great place to post something, whether it's a to-do list, whether it's um, something else that you want to work on, whether it's a new idea that you've got that you're not, you're not there yet. You haven't figured it out, but you want to explore it. A bathroom mirror is also another good place because you might be brushing your teeth and it's there in front of you. You can't help but notice it. But the interesting thing about the subconscious mind is even if you don't read the to-do list or the idea or whatever it is when you're brushing your teeth, your subconscious mind is picking up on it. It might, words might, um, words on your list or your, your idea, your mind can pick up on those and process them in the background. And that's again where you're hacking your subconscious mind. You're taking advantage of it by having it in a very obvious place. It can be in your, in your office, uh, wherever is obvious for you. So again, just picking the activities and items and choosing where you're going to put them. If you print print out a to-do list, put it in multiple places, then it's going to it's going to be there and present and you're going to remember and think of it more often. So that's the hack. Super simple, but again, they're all designed to be really easy to do. And Edison again, I, I've always loved this quote, never go to sleep without a request to your subconscious. Because of the fact your subconscious never sleeps, this idea is Reflect on something, a challenge or a problem that you're working on at work or something that you want to be more productive in or something that you're that you're thinking about. Read it just before you go to sleep. It's not a guarantee, but there's a chance your subconscious will process that while you're sleeping when it's doing everything else it's doing. And the, the optimistic solution is when you wake up in the morning, you've got something, you've got a, you've got an answer. You've, you've progressed that idea. Your subconscious has worked on it when you went to sleep. So there's no reason not to do it because you might wake up in the morning and you're not any further along, but there is a chance your subconscious can figure something out. A challenge that you've been trying to figure out on your own, it happens while you sleep, which is pretty amazing. All right, so moving along, uh, hack three is called vision. And I got exposed to this when I started coaching and it's, it's a really powerful concept. It's one that not everyone buys into, but if you do, it's also a hack that bypasses your conscious mind that, that tells you, uh, I don't know if you can do it, or there's, there's reasons, or this is difficult. You're bypassing that, which is a great hack. So the way this works, and the worksheet has a, a, a two-page breakdown of prompts for this, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the high-level ones right now, and a vision is simply you projecting yourself into the future and envisioning yourself succeeding at whatever it is you want to succeed, being more productive, uh, leading your team, uh, achieving an award, whatever that might be. So you suspend all of the restrictions that you are aware of, like budget, like experience, whatever, whatever those might be. You put them all aside. This is why some people have a difficult time because those are all in your mind. Your, your, your conscious mind will put those in the forefront. But you have to put yourself into the future and picture that ideal state of achieving whatever it is you want to achieve. So in order to do that, the, the top level ones are giving it a name, giving it a, an inspiring name. Uh, so it might be, so if I, I use an example of writing a book. Uh, the book it might be receiving an award from a publisher, Penguin Books. Uh, award for new best authors, as an example. And so you name it and you summarize it. So what's happening? You're receiving an award, you're, you're, you've sold a, a 100,000 copies, whatever it might be, whatever's important to you. And again, it can be to do with productivity or it can be to do with any aspect of your life. And then it's important to define the impact that you want that to have. Because again, like we were sharing before, if you know the impact that you're having, the more likely you're going to want to achieve it. And then there's a part called the celebration moment. And this is you projecting yourself into the future, describing that scene. In detail is important. The more vivid it is, the more appealing it is. Just like that quote from Steve Jobs, the stronger the vision, the more you're gonna be drawn to it. So I'll just give you a quick example of a celebration moment that I composed before when it comes to writing a book. So the, the vision is, is in December this year. And the celebration moment is this. A moment ago, I cracked open the book 
to smell that sweet scent of freshly printed words on paper. I'm now reading chapter one to my entire family, all gathered round the blazing fire in our family home. This is in Canada in the winter, so there's a fire. There's a need for a fire. I glance up periodically between sentences and see a giant beaming smile on my dad's face each time. So that's an example of that celebration moment. So all of your thinking is into the future and you're thinking, what does that look like? You wanna make it as exciting as possible without concerning yourself about what's gonna stop you from getting there. Because the whole idea with the vision, you're hypothetically putting yourself into the future and then you can work backwards to the present. What are the goals that I need to achieve to achieve that vision? So it allows you to break something down. There's so much study and research done on this that when you put yourself there, it's like setting a goal or it's beyond a goal. It's setting the vision for what you want. When you have a vivid picture of that, you increase the chances of you achieving it astronomically. And as a result, with clear goals that it'll take to get there, you're gonna be more productive. You're gonna know exactly what you need to do to work towards that vision. So that's, that's how that breaks down. And it becomes really, really powerful. Okay, the fourth hack. This one, you might have heard of Parkinson's Law. The, the image is a book. It was written by a gentleman named Parkinson. And the, the, the law is simply this. Work expands to fill the time available for its completion. The first, I came, the first time I came across this was, if you're familiar with Tim Ferriss in the four-hour work week, he references Parkinson's Law in his book. And that's where I first heard of it. And I, and I, I thought about it. And I thought, that is so true. When I thought about my own life, work expanding to fill the time that's there. And so what that means is, to give you a more concrete example, let's say it's Monday and you're given a task or there's a project and you've got to complete something by Friday, 5 p.m. You're given it on Monday, the deadline's Friday. As you work on it, you're going to gradually get closer. You're going to, you're going to complete it. And there's a good chance you're going to complete it pretty close to Friday at 5 p.m. because that's the deadline. So the work the, the tasks that are involved in it expand to fill that time. So on this graph, you see the effort peaks in the beginning and then it declines and there's a tail towards the time allocated for it. So th I found this so true. So many times I, there's a deadline and I get it done just before the deadline. And, and I always thought, okay, that's interesting. It's good timing that I got it done just in time. But this law is actually in effect. So what the hack is here, and, it, and I've used this many times and I love it, because of the result. So what you're doing, using my example, Monday you get the task, Friday is the due date. If you look at the task or the project and you say, okay, wh when can I actually get this done? If I work at this dedicatedly, what, when can I finish it? Is Thursday at 5 p.m. possible versus Friday at 5 p.m., the real deadline? So you say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work towards Thursday at 5 p.m. to get it done, which would mean if I do that, if I succeed, I've freed up 24 hours between my deadline and the real deadline. So that's that's essentially the hack, picking a new deadline. And uh, to further deepen that in, in your, your success is coming up with a replacement activity. That's something that you want to enjoy doing, that, that's, that's fun. So you could do, if you finish it and submit it on Thursday at 5 p.m., You've got Friday, you've got this free time suddenly. Now there is a there is an element to do with this around if you're an employee versus uh, you have your own business or you're in control of your own time. Unfortunately, many organizations don't reward people for being really productive in getting things done early. If you say to your boss, the deadline was Friday at 5 p.m., but here it is, it's Thursday at 5 p.m., I've got it done. Often a boss will give you more work and say, okay, thanks, here's more to do. As opposed to saying, Awesome job being ultra productive. Take Friday off. Wouldn't that be amazing to get that response? And that would encourage you even more because then that activity that you want to do is there. Um, that said, it's still a great way to hack Parkinson's law by working on a shorter timeline. And you can be more focused in doing it as you go. I've done this in the beginning. It's not that easy because you know in the back of your mind the real deadline. So you think if I don't make my new deadline, it's okay, because I've got more time. But even if you finish it, say by Friday morning, then you've still freed up Friday afternoon. So you've unlocked that time to do something else. So again, super simple, that's how it works. But think about it as well, as in this law, I've seen it happen so many times, but after a while of practicing this, setting a new artificial deadline, I've had uh, a lot of success in doing that. And in studies, Studies show that 
the quality of work, even if you have one day less to complete it, it's marginal. It's not even noticeable, the difference. So that extra time doesn't add much benefit and it's filled all of the time available. So those are the four hacks. I wanna give you just this one kind of pro tip, this encouragement uh, that relates to all of these hacks and everything else. I've worked with almost every single coaching client I've ever worked with. I've told them at some point in the coaching relationship to get everything out of their head. Because when people are struggling with something to make a decision or choose a path, they're processing it all in their head. It ends up being a big cloudy mess in their mind. Whereas if they write it out or digitize it, type it out, or even better, draw it out and download it from their head and they can look at it in front of them, often you make so much more sense of it when that's the case. Trying to resolve it all in your head is as powerful and, and smart as your brain is, it's not the best way to do it. So my, my pro tip here, and, and again, I've used this with so many clients and so many of them have been, wow, that, that's so much better when I can look at everything in front of me. If I've got a decision to make, I can see which decision more clearly is the better one. Or if I've got to prioritize a range of tasks, if I write them all out and I look at them side by side, as opposed to trying to get the trying to resolve that in my head, the result is typically better. You get more clarity and understanding of what's involved, how you can prioritize things and so on. So that's just my closing tip. Okay, so few in a sense, I, I wanted to uh, adequately cover those. Again, it, it is a bit of an overview of those four hacks as well as the golden circle concept. But thank you for listening. Two things, uh, first, I want to open it up again. So I'm welcoming uh, volunteers to come on camera and share a hack or even the golden circle approach, what you find either more most interesting to you or you think is, is applicable to your work, to your productivity that you could apply and try. Again, they're not all guaranteed, but my encouragement is to try them, tweak them, fine tune them, share them with others to get an understanding of what works. So can we have uh, some volunteers share, again, just briefly share with everyone what stood out to you, either that you think, oh, I really want to try this, or I could see that working really well with my team, or if I do that better, I'm going to be much more productive, and it's going to have this positive impact. Hmm. Okay, I will just clarify, is the why circle included as the one of the hacks, right? Yeah, so loosely it is, yeah. It's it's deeper and more foundational, but yeah, let's call it a hack also. You know, actually, I wanted to speak earlier. I volunteered, er, volunteered earlier because my reply to that actually was very simple. My why is I just, I am a nurturer by, you know, as a person, by nature, I, I know I'm a nurturer. And my why is I just want to be the best mother that I can be. You know, and bring up my children into men and women of character. And when I see them grow up happy and grow up like that, I think I have been fulfilled my why. And that is why, no matter how stressful it is at the office, I work for the government, for interior and local government. And even though at times we cannot be productive, you know, I still am, I actually can, or I actually experience what you say that, you know, I'm very happy waking up. Each morning going to work, you know, no matter how, you know, un unfavorable the environment may be. Yes, actually it doesn't hurt me at all. Maybe it, it's just a scratch, but basically at the end of the day, I'm happy, I'm fulfilled, and I have accomplished a lot. So maybe that is why I feel I'm productive because my why is at my home in my face all the time. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> all right. No, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. And, and yeah, it, it's... So I, I've heard that fairly often from women saying my, my purpose in life is to raise my kids. And, and that's great. There's, there's, that's a very honorable uh, thing. And then you, you, I think you said also to raise them as men and women of character, I think you said. And yeah. which, so that's going a little bit deeper um, because to be a great mother, that's good. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's, it's very honorable. But then, yeah, so I encourage you to think, well, if you're a great mother, what happens? Um, in, in my why, there's a so that statement where it says, I want to I want to kickstart the inner fire in people so that they joyfully pursue their greatest potential. So as a great mother, what's the so that that you want to happen so that your kids do what? 
become men and women of character. So yeah. Keep exploring that. So what does even that mean? What does men and women of, of good character mean? And then as you go deeper, it's like peeling back the layers of an onion. Uh, you're going deeper and deeper to your core. And the advantage of that is as you go deeper, then you can think about your how. How can I then impact them? Because yes, you're the mother, you're raising them, you're doing the mother things that, that you should do, but are there ways then that you could use perhaps some of your unique talents? Or are there some ways that you could connect your children with other children in the community or with volunteer opportunities to expose them to more? Um, so those are the types of things that then as you get more concrete on your why, then you can think, how can I do that? How can I have a bigger impact in different interesting ways? So you're definitely on the right track, but keep going, keep going with that thought because that's going deeper and the deeper you go, it's going to resonate with you more. It's going to feel more like this is who I am. I, yes, I, I can follow. Yes. Yes. And I'm already imagining what you're trying to say, but yes, thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. All right, maybe we can read some of the questions already. So one of the first questions was from Mr. Kenneth Mindahau. So how can we modi- motivate people stuck in the traditional way of thinking who cannot step up to become more productive person in this time of the pandemic? Right, so yeah, good question. And it, productivity is always good, but even more so uh, right now. My, my encouragement there, I mean, obviously try these hacks that I've shared, but a general encouragement would be to talk about it with others because I, I'm just such a big believer going back to that burstiness thing. You don't have burstiness when you're on your own. You have burstiness when you're with one or, or two or more other people um, because then you start building off of one another's ideas. It's hard to sit there and think, how can I be more productive? But if you're with a colleague or you're with someone else, even, even your spouse and just say, how can we, how can we do something better? For um, for the way that we're uh, managing the work from home scenario, how can we be more productive with our time? Let's let's get creative around that. Is it a matter of scheduling uh, alternating schedules or looking after the kids in a different way, whatever that might be, or looking at ways to uh, more creatively engage with your team? Uh, because again, in, in a work from home scenario, we're not seeing each other face to face, so that's that can be less productive. So are there ways to um, be more productive in that sense? Could that be, again, just throwing out ideas? Could be having uh, each member of a team leading a meeting once a week. So then they then come up with um, ideas about what's important or what they covered last week and what will be happening uh, in the next week coming. So my encouragement is to to work with other people on it uh, in, in terms of being creative and exploring ways of being creative because t- each team is different. Most organizations differ from one another. Certain things that work in one in one scenario won't necessarily work in another. So using your, your intimate knowledge of your organization, your team, uh, the, the challenge that, that they face, be creative around those. All right. Thank you, Sir David, for that wonderful answer. Um, another question from Mr. J. Duplito is, can we set up our work arrangement, what Mr. Mark Zuckerberg and Google has been doing with their technology? So very relevant for the work from home or uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic. Well, the, is the, the scenario with Facebook that is the comment in regulation to them allowing every employee to work remotely for the rest of their their time that like Facebook did announce that along with some other companies. Uh, so here, I mean, here in the Philippines, uh, I know some people that have gone back to work, back to the office, but I, I know many people that are are still working from home for an indefinite amount of time or uh, uh, quite a ways into the future before they go back. Uh, so I, I think, I personally think there's a lot of value in face-to-face engagement. That burstiness I was referring to, that I keep referring to, often, happens better or more easily in a face-to-face environment. Not to say it can't happen uh, in a a remote environment, it certainly can, Uh, but so I'm a believer in face-to-face engagement. A lot of the work that we used to do was all face-to-face, which we now use other tools like apps like this, as well as Miro, like an online collaboration tool, 
in others. So I, I don't, um, I'm not a salesperson for Miro, but I love Miro because it's basically an online collaboration tool, a, a big virtual whiteboard. Um, so if you're not familiar with that, that is a great way to incorporate a lot of what you used to do face to face with your team in an online environment. It's a huge space. You, you can incorporate, you can add uh, tools to it. You can use the space to plot projects, to collaborate. Uh, we do design thinking work in um, inside Miro. So tools, I, I think, are key to continuing to be productive in this work from home environment. Uh, so I would also say, so that's the technology side. So there are some great tools out there. The other side of it is, I would again look at yourself individually where i keep i keep talking about that often how you can as an individual look at how can i maximize the impact that i have in my environment i'm i'm very um thankful that you know this this topic is uh provided especially the the thing about hack i think the five minute hack is uh what i consider applicable for me uh as a medical social worker you know i work uh, sometimes more than eight hours, you know, as I go home, I'm exhausted. But at the end of the day, you still need to uh, figure out how you can have these certain, you know, activities that you can still provide uh, for yourself. And one of the things that I want to um, ask is that how can we incorporate um, self-care into our productivity? Because for me, I think, I believe that for you to be a uh, productive in everything you do at work you should also consider how to you know take good care of yourself because that's the very first thing that you need to do before you can give especially for us we provide different all kinds of services to our patients and not just um the medical needs but also purposes that they want to have in life because these are patients that are sick you know, and some of them are, you know, they just want to lose hope because they don't believe anymore that they can be uh, right. cured. Yeah, that's right. the question. Thank okay, you. sure. It's a great question because you're right, especially in the industry that you're in. If you burn out, then you're no good to anyone. Um, so, and, and it, some people are really honorable and they push themselves so much because they think there's so much, there's so much need, there's so much to do. Which, which can be true, but if they burn out and they get sick or, or something happens, then they're not they're not helping anyone. So self care is is a huge part of it. You mentioned that the five minute hack, and uh, again, that that's a great one. I would say for that, and so I would look at okay, what what's important to you? Is it physical activity? Is it reading? Is it spending time with your kids? So again, it's making it really personal, reflecting on your own life, and saying what are the key things I can do either before I go to work or when I get home from work that I can do to honor myself in that way. If you really like reading, as an example, if that calms you down, if that, if that takes your mind off things, then get five, even if it's just five minutes, get that in, say, before you go to sleep or when you wake up in the morning, don't look at your, don't look at your phone, just take some time to read. Or maybe it's listening to music. Maybe music's important to you and it just allows you to feel peace in things. So it's looking at doing that. And again, five minutes is the number because it's so easy to do. But you could say, okay, I, I get up, I can get up 30 minutes before anyone else does. So I'm gonna give myself 30 minutes or 20 minutes to listen to music. Or again, I don't know what 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 resonates and what's important to you. It's only you that do that does. So figure out what those things are and come up with again two, three, or four of them and schedule it in. It might sound funny to schedule it in, but it makes such a big difference. So it because you've got to schedule it first before you make it a habit. Once you make it a habit, you don't have to schedule it anymore. It becomes part of your routine. And then what's great is then that self-care act those self-care activities are part of your routine. So you don't even have to think about it anymore. You're like, okay, I'm waking up, my alarm's going off 30 minutes before. But I've got that that peace and that quiet at that time to read, to listen to music, to pray, whatever it is that's important to you. Uh, and again, it comes to your schedule. If in your schedule you can get out of, you can go out at lunch to take a 10 minute walk even. Maybe that that's what you love doing. And that's a great way to break up a day and to give you some uh, some quiet, some peace, some opportunity to think. So it really comes down to your own schedule and what fits, but even more importantly, what's important to you and what's going to give you that the most good feelings and the most benefit to come with it and ultimately again that rush feeling because again you might think well 
I've, I've been gaining some really great experience in working in the work that I do, and I want to share that in some way. Maybe I don't want to write a book, but maybe you want to do, you want to record some short videos, uh, sharing your experiences and sharing your stories because you could help others in other parts of the country or even in other parts of the world. That, for, not for everyone, but for some people that might give them that rush. They might think, wow, like I'm using all this experience I've gained and I'm actually sharing it with others. I'm scaling it to have an impact on other people. That, you might get excited about that. Maybe it's the video recording part. Maybe you just, you like recording yourself. You like seeing yourself on video as an example. That gives you a rush. Maybe it doesn't. So it's determining what does resonate with you and making sure that that fits into your schedule. Thank you, Sir David. So thank you then, Ms. Maripa, for that wonderful question. We'll try Mr. Ergardo Abanil again. All right, yeah. sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my uh, response to the poll is about uh, five-minute hacks. Okay. Uh, I usually pray before and uh, before sleeping and uh, upon waking up in the morning. But what I got a uh, challenge upon is when it comes to uh, exercise and mindfulness, because uh, this, uh, some distractions would usually prevent me from maintaining those uh, daily routine. However, right. But, but uh, however, in, in terms of praying, there's no fail uh, in it. The other two, which is my, practicing mindfulness and uh, exercising, uh, usually is uh, sacrificed on a daily basis. So what, what can I do to be consistent in my routine? Uh, in, in segmenting the day into bits of uh, useful activities. Sure, great question. So what I would say to you is, you, you've obviously made it work when it comes to praying. So I, I would look at what's allowed you to get to that ease that comfort level with praying what's allowed you to embed that into your schedule with no problems because there's very likely something about that that could also apply to the mindfulness could apply to other areas so that's one suggestion to think about that what's allowed you to build that really good habit and that's what i was saying earlier that though it's universal if you figure out how to create a habit in one thing there's a good chance that the, the approach or the technique that you use also applies to other things. The other thing I would say, uh, the, the second part would be, again, look at your schedule. And sometimes it's a matter of like carving out time, forcing something into your schedule to start. So you start building the routine and then it becomes the habit. Often in the beginning, before you get something started, you've got to be more deliberate about making sure it happens. And, and to get kind of technical on it, I would say, if let's say, again, at lunch is a good time for you to, to break up the day and take a walk and just to clear your mind, if that's important to you, I would set it in your calendar so a notification comes up to do it. I would even say, I'm going to put a note somewhere at that top of mind thing, so above your desk or on your fridge, put a note that says mindfulness walk. So you keep reminding yourself, and it's that effect that I was talking about. The more you see something, it might just say mindfulness walk, or you might cut out a picture of a magazine of a nice like a country walk as an example. And that's the visual trigger for that. It's all about hacking your mind. So it puts something that's appealing. If it's a nice country walk, that's the image, and then add, add mindfulness walk to that. And add 12 noon, if, that, if that's when you always want to do it. So you just, that repetition, because even if you don't do anything else, if you keep saying that every day, it's on your on your ref, it's on your back your mirror, you're gonna probably get to a point where you're like, okay, I really have to take that walk, because <laughs> it's so common now, and your subconscious can start working on that. So that that's another great way to do it, is really make it top of mind, but also kind of force it into your schedule until it becomes a habit and a routine that you don't have to do that anymore. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, distraction is really hard to fight sometimes. It is, but it, it's that persistence that you have to have. And it's like most successes in life. Most of the people that have done something successfully, they've tried and failed a number of times. And yeah. they, they were persistent enough. They had enough grit to keep trying again and to get it into their schedule or to get it into the habit that they needed 
and then that's what works. But I'll, I'll fully acknowledge that yeah, it's hard sometimes to start new habits and start new routines. But when you when you're persistent, when you see the benefit, the bigger picture. Uh, so you're saying I want to do a mindfulness walk. Why do you want to do it? Again, there's that why again. Ask yourself why. What is it going to give me? Is it a break from work? Is it an opportunity to reflect on what I'm grateful for? Is it an opportunity for whatever it is? Detail those because the more you understand the reason why you want something, it's more than it, it becomes easier than just saying I, I have to do this walk. I want to do this walk because it's going to give me these things. And again, detailing those out that's a that's a powerful way to envision yourself doing it because it's not about the walk anymore it's about what the walk gives you and what the results are from it so that's another it's a third element to really get your mind working in such a way that it's not the walk anymore it's what the benefit or the result that walk provides thank you indeed sir uh, i learned a lot from this uh, great webinar series thank you thank you all right thanks for the thank question you, sir. Sure. thank you sir ricardo Thank so, you. Uh, and uh, so now let's try to uh, accommodate some questions from the chat sure. for the benefit of the people who um, can join us through um, the live camera. Last question, I think. Mm. So we have a question from Mr. Michael Vincent Milam Billing. He was asking about, if I understood correctly, the hacks mentioned affect our productivity as individuals. Is there any way to implement these hacks on an organizational level, especially in the government and GOCC agencies, which are, by their nature, not what we'd call uh, progressive thinking? So what can you say about that, sir? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, and it's a valid one because an organization may not be that conducive to new ways of thinking or, or new approaches, but also the, the people in there. Again, going back to humans, we're, we're a collection of, of humans. So what I, would, what I would say from a hack perspective, I would say if, if you've got a team that you're working with, say, let, I, I learned these hacks and I want to I share them with others to see if there's benefit or if there's interest in, in trying those, that's one. I would also say, can we look at these and, and look at a way that our team, that our organization can use these in the way that we work? Because again, it comes down to the individuals on the team, it comes back to the organization, the culture there, that you might have some resistance. You might have difficulty to make that happen or convince people to try new things. But a great way of doing it is throwing it out there and not just saying, okay, we have to do this, but it's saying, as a team, let's explore some new ways of being productive. Let's explore some new ways of getting things done or being more creative or connecting with others. So it's more uh, an offer than it is a, a command, if, if you will. When it comes to those specific hacks, the Parkinson's law hack. So let's say there's a team project. Um, so it's not an individual one. The team project has a deadline of Friday at 5 p.m., just like the example I was giving. Then you don't just say, okay, the deadline is actually Thursday at 5 p.m. It's saying, okay, team, let's explore this. What if we work to a deadline of Thursday at 5 p.m. rather than the real deadline? And as we do that, we work together. We look how we can collaborate together. And we then free up Friday to work on other things. And again, if there's the ability to say, okay, if we get this, if we actually get this done by Thursday at 5 p.m., maybe not let's take Friday off, but let's go for, let's take an extended lunch on Friday, or let's let's have some sort of reward for doing it. So that one applies as much to individuals as it applies to teams. And, and again, what I want to say that it's not so much about doing it exactly as the hack I've shared. The hacks, again, I try, they're, they're as simple and practical as possible, but at the same time, they're very much open to fine tuning or adjusting based on the team, based on an individual and, and how they work. Um, so it's looking at doing it that way. Even the, the five minute hack saying, at, so here, here's, here's a variation of it. So let's say you've got a weekly team meeting. So at the beginning, the first five minutes of the meeting, rather than the, the manager saying, okay, what's, what's the agenda? What are we gonna do? That first five minutes of every meeting is allocated to a different team member each week to summarize the achievements of the previous week. So there's an opportunity for that team member to share only in five minutes, just share with the group. They can create a visual, they can just share 
again, it's up to them, what, what they achieved the last week. And the benefit of that, there's a number of benefits to that. One is that you're giving team members an opportunity to, to, to collaborate, to communicate. It's giving them confidence because they've got to share. They've got to prepare that five-minute presentation. That's, that's one great benefit is the opportunity to share and, and um, communicate. Another one is storytelling. So they're, they're having the ability to comprise the achievements of the past week into a five-minute summary. Uh, the other one is you're capturing those stories. So storytelling is so powerful, but unfortunately, many organizations don't capture it. Those stories remain in people's heads and they never get told again. So if you have each week someone on the team sharing what, what we achieved last week, it's a great reminder to the team of what's been done, what, what we've been doing. Even though it's work from home and it's the pandemic and it's these challenges, it's a great way to say, even though despite all of these, these circumstances we're in, we still achieved this last week. We, we were productive in this sense, or we closed this project sooner than, than on budget or, or under budget or under time and, and things like that. So again, it's just a very practical way to use that five minute hack in a different way and giving, giving the, the, um, the, the power to individual team members to share in what, in what they've done. So that, that's again, so I, I encourage you to go into it with an open mind. Yes, I was saying wedge in five minutes in your schedule in the morning or later with some specific activities, but because five minutes is so short, is there something I can do with my team in a, in a five minute thing? And if you say, okay, I don't, I don't really like that idea, use that five minutes in a different way. Close the meeting with a five minute opportunity for each of the team members to say, this is the impact I wanna have this week coming up. Uh, so it could be different. It's not summarizing the successes. It's saying wh whatever we talked about, how can each team member one at a time, one at, once a week say, this is what I want to do. This is the impact I want to have. This is the vision I have for this project. So it also makes the projects and the work not as mundane or not as boring as it might be because you're saying, you're giving people an opportunity to say, this is what I want to do with this. Okay, it's a fairly standard task, but I want to take it to the next level. I want to have a bigger impact and I want your help team to figure out how we can do that. I want it, we want to stand out. We want to be a model team to our organization. We want to have a bigger impact on the citizens in the region that we work in. And we want to be recognized for that. Not for recognition's sake, but we want to be seen as leaders in the community by doing something that's different or doing something that's more powerful. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, that wraps up our discussion for today. All right, so I believe we had an interesting discussion on this afternoon. I would like to thank everyone for actively participating in this chat box. On behalf of the Academy, I would like to thank everyone for watching. So we hope you will join us in our next webinar series. So again, my name is Gerard Calambro. My name is Michael Sarabia. And I'm David O'Hagan. So thanks again, everyone. And could we just flash up that final slide again um, on the screen that just has my contact details. And as I mentioned earlier on, anyone that contacts me, I'm happy to share the worksheet that went along with the hacks. Or okay. in addition to that, if you're interested in some of our other productivity programs or workshops, uh, we also have what we call a productivity burst, which is this rapid uh, productivity session that we do with individuals. Or if you're interested in more on personal why and things like that, feel free to get in touch. I'd love to connect with others on that. Um, but I'm uh, at the baseline, I'm happy to give out email or, or send out the hack worksheet as well that has more detail on those that I discussed. So thank you very much, uh, Gerard and Mike, and DAP as well for the opportunity to share today. And uh, I look forward to hearing from some of the participants. All right, thanks everyone.